Joseph Chen is, in my opinion, one of the most skilled grapplers in the world. I already knew that. It's like I have a gun pointed at your head. My video about Joseph Chen's performance at the ADCC trials got a lot of good feedback. My mom was like, this video is so amazing. And recently I had the opportunity to sit down with Joseph and his coach Dima to get a peek behind the curtain. And I'm kind of on the fence about releasing the whole conversation, so here's what we're gonna do. If this video gets 3,000 likes, I'll make it publicly available on YouTube. But if not, the full conversation is just gonna be in my Discord, which is included in your membership to the Outlier database, which is quickly becoming the best study tool in Jiu-Jitsu. To. So if you want to see some examples of people using a cross scoop grip to pass the guard, you can search it and find examples of this sequence and dive further into whichever one piques your interest. And you can see Joseph has the cross scoop grip on the far side and he uses a near side knee pull to expose his opponent's back. And if we dive deeper into this sequence, you can see there's a training resource associated with it. And it's a free resource of Danaher talking about a near side arm pull in the gi. Always have one option with a gi that you never have no gi, which is to grab the near side arm, <laughs> lift and expose your training partner's back. And in this sequence, Joseph used a similar idea, but he modified the technique to a near side knee pull. And if you like a given sequence, a match, or a training resource, you now have the ability to save it to a folder. And I'm going to go ahead and save this sequence to my YouTube folder as well as my North-South guard passing folder. Now my YouTube folder is where I'm saving the footage that I used in my videos for you all to reference. And anyone can see it because it's a public folder. But you can also make private folders and organize them any way you want. And I know something a lot of people are studying right now is passing to North-South. So you can make a private folder of sequences that you found helpful. And if you want to share this with your friends or you're a coach wanting to give your students some study material, you can share the private folder with specific users here. So if you're interested in this tool, it's called the Outlier Database and the link is in the description below. And now let's get into my conversation with Joseph and Dima. Let's first synchronize the, the audio. Joseph is someone who has a very wide range of skills and he attributes this to his curiosity in the training room. I think a lot of my motivation, like, to train and improve in jujitsu was never like it was never competition oriented so it was more just i was curious and i wanted to take it further so this, is, this is like a lot of the reason of my like uh yeah I love my game is the way it is one skill that joseph is exceptionally good at and has a lot of confidence in is what dima calls base training and if you look at golden ryan especially in edge's training you see he's doing it. If you look at Craig, he's doing it too. Like these two come to my mind and we try to mimic it right now. I call it base training, where you go into an entanglement and you try to pressure from there. So you bring your whole weight into your partner and it gets them out. Like if someone gets me into offense, it's like, I want to be comfortable, not just like defending from there, but also being comfortable staying there, not necessarily like having to panic or get out. Because I think this is a lot of what, like what, what you're referring to. Like, I think this type of base training is good because trying to make it so that it's no longer like them winning because they have the guard, but almost that they're getting tired because they have to keep it in place. So because Joseph has such a wide range of skills, he can go into a competition with confidence from almost any position. So if someone enters into his legs, he has the ability to not only defend, but counter. Yeah, like a sequence that comes to my mind right now. Um, cause I've been studying a lot of like wedging back takes and in your W and O match against Derek, you were trying to do your high step passing. And then he ends up like throwing his legs to outside Ashi, um, with a scoop grip. And you were just like, cool, I'm just like, accept this entanglement and like go in for my back take. And you ended up taking his back, but it just sh kind of shows exactly what you're talking about. Like he's very comfortable with people, um, entangling his legs. And this is what makes Joseph such a good competitor, right? Wrong comes to competition, he has a big, big problem to transfer every skill, okay? He had some skills where he was really confident and the other skills where he should be really confident because he's still beating everyone up in the gym with us, he couldn't bring it to the table. When it comes to competition, there's a lot of alpha mentality. Guys, we have an epidemic of alpha males in this sport. And people try and enforce the strategy that they're most confident in. A lot of people will say when you compete, it's like you want to bring the opponent into your game, right? You don't want to think about what their game is. But I also do think there's some validity to it, especially the better your opponents get, right? So like, for, especially for someone like the course, whom are specialists, you de definitely want to try to avoid it. Obviously not to 
compromise your own game just so that, let's say, you don't necessarily play where they're very strong. But on the other hand, in an ideal world, there's a perfect strategy that exists that's going to minimize risk and be the most efficient way to win against a given opponent. And oftentimes, there's going to be a disconnect between the strategy that you're confident in and the perfect strategy. And because Joseph is so carefree in his training, in competition, he would tend to go down paths that he had confidence in, even though they weren't the perfect strategy to win against that opponent. It's like, I'll play bottom, top, I'll wrestle maybe a little bit. And I feel like I kind of lack direction in some sense, especially competitively. Where I'm like, I don't know if I'll pull, I don't know if I'll wrestle, I don't know if I'll play top or bottom. Joseph is confident in his ability to defend and counter from outside Ashi. So Joseph does have a path to victory from here. But if Mateus is your opponent, there's going to be a lot of risk associated with going through outside Ashi. So in his first match against Mateus, there was a lot of disconnect between the path that Joseph was confident in and the perfect strategy to beat him. He was engaging in every guard all the time, okay? And why was it like this? Because he was really good at it. So it doesn't matter if he engaged in your butterfly guard, your reverse de la Hiba and your de la Hiba. He could basically put pressure from there and pass you. So, but that's the problem. If you train like this, you will compete like this. So again, his biggest challenge, Matthias, he did basically the same thing, and you can't do it against a high-level competitor. You need to adjust your strategy based on their strength. Another athlete that has a wide range of skills but has struggled in the past to bring those skills into competition is Jason Rao. But he had a good run at the recent ADCC East Coast Trials, and Dima was there to coach him. And the purpose of Dima's coaching is to bridge that gap and align Jason's confidence with the perfect strategy. And I saw that... He was just sitting. He wasn't even standing up. He wasn't going uh, to his knees. He was just trying to do a leg lock. And then if it's not working, he stopped. And if you look at his past matches, that's how he competed, right? He tried to get a leg lock. People disengaged because, you know, always Jason around. He would probably leg lock me. And then he's just remaining seated. So at the two minutes mark of the warm-up, I was telling him, bro, just stand up and run them over. You are one of the best passers in the world. His passing is way better than his leg lock. And his leg locks are amazing. You know, nobody wants to be under Jason Rao. After five minutes, we had the real Jason Rao in the room. And I think that's what you saw at the East Coast Trials. Especially in the first day, the strategy was to stand up, run them over, pass them, and choke them. And that's what he did. At the second day, the strategy was a little bit different. I want to uh, talk about the Mayfield match because Mayfield, I love you, but he leads with his right leg and he puts it on your left hamstring, right? And he just stands there. He has a ridiculous base. And then what he tries to do is to fight the legs with his hand. And if it's not working, he resets the system. So even if you know what he's going to do, he will just reset the system and do it again. And then you will get the right hand under hook and knee cut. Boom. That's how he beat a bit of Sebastian Rodriguez, right? So with Jason, it was like, finally, we have someone that will not concede bubble position. If you have him, he will not fall. And then you can actually footlock him. I didn't specifically say, are you okay? That was his thing. But that was, that was basically the game plan. Picture perfect. Now Joseph is hoping that Dima's coaching will help him overcome some similar obstacles. There were almost two... Um like um, whatever, or like too carefree and whatever techniques I choose a lot of the time. So like, it'll sometimes just be, okay, I feel like I can do this. It won't be, okay, what's the most optimal or what what's going to be the easiest path to success or the safest passes, path to success. It's like more what I feel like I'm going to do. And so like having that degree of guidance in regards to, um, okay, in these matches, th these are where we can display our game versus this is where we're going to have to like kind of tone it back a little bit. But in order for this to work, Joseph has to trust Dima. A good athlete coach relationship or a good athlete is someone that has confidence in what you say and listens. Like, because if you like second guess it, then there's like a little bit of doubt in your mind where you can kind of almost deviate from the plan or not have full faith in it. And let's say you don't have full faith in, it, in the plan and you don't trust it. Then that can lead to situations where, oh, you know, maybe you're not going to commit like to this or commit to the plan. So like, for example, if something that have happened previously with me and like I've done it in matches plenty of times where it's like, I'm having trouble in the standing position. I'm like, fuck it, I'll, I'll pull guard. This is something that Dima told me, okay, don't pull guard in certain matches. And then that would really force me to like, not just concede for no reason. And mm -hmm. so 
having trust in like his judgment in this regard, knowing that, okay, I, I trust him. I'll do that and I'll do it to the extent that I'm capable of. So after they agreed to work with one another, Dima gets started. And the first step is to develop the perfect strategy for the athletes that Joseph is most likely to encounter at the trials. So basically I picked out, I think, eight or nine names that I thought were likely to be on top. So I called it Joseph ADCC hit list. And what I do, I want to figure out their strength, their weaknesses, and the strategy. And yeah, I try to not have any emotions on that. I just see what they can do, what they can do, and what Joseph can and can do. And then we do the perfect strategy for it. And it's really important to also find training footage. And it's, it's the best if we have recent footage. Because if you have older footage, sometimes you look up maybe a totally different grappler. Once we have the strategy in place, we need to design a training program leading into the competition. And the purpose of the training program is to bridge the gap between the path that Joseph is most confident in and the perfect strategy. Because how you train is how you compete. And Joseph case, like it was the training, at Rouse case, it was the training. This is the hardest part of a coach, picking what you're going to teach and how you're going to teach it. And one of the biggest skills that they worked on heading into the trials was breaking Joseph's habit of accepting leg entanglements and working on what Dima calls rumble passing. Because one of the most important skills that we worked on for ADCC is not getting entangled. We only structured the camp basically for Mateos and because Joseph spent his whole life basically getting entangled. So just that, that he's prepared. Everything else, he was already prepared. He's prepared to go in there and give your leg and stay heavy. So that was the reason behind it. Like if you, for example, look at wrestlers, they have a really unique style of passing. I call it rumble passing, where you basically have a wrestler stance. You have your head low, you have your hands into the front, and you don't get engaged. So popular people that are doing it are like Dorian, Isaac, and that's what we try to mimic a little bit. But like we talked about before, Joseph has a wide range of skills and he already knows how to do this rumble type of passing. So if rumble type passing is going to be our perfect strategy to win against certain opponents, the question becomes, why is Joseph not confident in implementing that strategy? Rumble passing, like where you're managing the range. I think it's easiest to do that style of passing when you have a noticeable wrestling advantage. This type of passing where you're very wary on engagement it does leave the opponent uh, the opportunity to heist, right? And this is something generally I don't want, like just because it's, I wouldn't say wrestling is my strong suit. So I would really like to engage and play super tight in this regard. Joseph has a lot of confidence in his base passing, but base passing and rumble passing are two opposing ideas. So if you want to beat people down, you need more connection, right? So you probably need to be a little bit closer and if you don't want to get entangled, like it comes at the price that your partner can stand up. So what we learned is Joseph has more confidence in his base passing because it makes it hard for his opponent to stand up. But rumble passing is gonna give your opponent the ability to heist. And because Joseph is not confident in his wrestling, he lacks confidence in implementing this rumble passing strategy. So we need to figure out why Joseph is lacking confidence in wrestling and design a training program to help give him that confidence. Another hole in Joseph's game, was his confidence in the standing position because it's not because of technique but he wasn't confident that he's not getting gas right so after the experience with Kenta he <laughs> fucked Joseph up <laughs> <laughs> do you feel that when you're walking around the house and you're like <laughs> no fuck that <laughs> he doubted himself but he doesn't need to because his wrestling is amazing so we just needed to modify the training and that's what we did we brought Lino Lino his gas tank is crazy. He can go for days. We call him the engine. Venus is not stopping. He's going 100% the whole time. And we did that for Joe's preparation also, being there in a single leg, tiring him out and getting him confident. So if you have a problem as a competitor, uh, as a competitor and you're really good in training, but you can't put it out on the stage, you have a problem somewhere. Find it. So now after the training camp, Joseph has confidence in his ability to implement both base and rumble passing. So now the question becomes skill selection. And which matches do you choose to use base passing and which do you choose to use rumble passing? I think a lot of what helped was like like skill selection or like move selection. Because I feel like 
a lot of the times, like a lot of these approaches are contradictory. So like engaging and then also being wary of engagement are almost two opposite ways that you can start looking to approach passing. But then picking the appropriate time to do what, I think was one of the main thing. And I think like what helped me a lot was obviously the training and like the some degree of like the mental barrier, but it was also just knowing in which matches, what techniques I would use. I think it's just hard to be a coach for yourself. Like Jogos is, is a smart guy. He's a good competitor. He's good in jiu-jitsu and he's also a good coach. Like he could break everything down for most people or for all people and have a good strategy, but it's hard to do it for yourself. Especially if you're someone that has a lot of technique, a lot like Joseph is good in so many things. So my biggest part was to select it, right? I needed to select that he's like a kid in the candy store. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. No, no, no. You're eating and then you get your squeeze. And basically, <laughs> just, no, for real, that was what I did. And when deciding which of these to implement, a very important factor to consider is the instant win capability of our opponent. Just like in MMA or boxing, in jiu-jitsu it doesn't matter if you're up big on the scorecards. If you make one little mistake, your opponent has the ability to win instantly, which is not the case in something like baseball or football, where there's not an instant win option. You have to distinguish between the threat of like positional advancement and the threat of a sub, right? So with Mateus, it's like the threat of like something that'll end the match. Whereas like a lot of things, if you if it's like just a positional threat, so like there are a lot of competitors who are very good positionally and they can like threaten that, but it's not necessarily going to end the match. So I feel like trying to prioritize that. If the lower apartment doesn't really have something in this arsenal like a really strong submission. So let's say you have Matthias, but without his footlock or without his heel hooks. I would go in there and try to tire them out because if they are good at the entanglement, but they are not good at finishing it, and I know that they can sweep me, I would purposely go in there to tire them out in this position. In terms of strategy against people like good jiu-jitsu players, but where I know I can put my pressure on and there's not the biggest threat of the move finish, I will go in there. Most people are not going to have the ability to finish Joseph. And Joseph is going to try and use the same base passing strategy that he's felt from Craig in the training room. Your round was great, your three rounds. What the fuck happened there? It was terrible. You know, it's like I don't even have the chance to escape. It's like, oh, I try to escape a little bit, but there's no more. I can't do it anymore. I, I don't think he can fuck up a white belt as bad as he fucked up. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Not like that Craig is a million times better than Joseph, right? But he tired them out from the entanglement positions, and Joseph is really good on getting there. But Craig is really good on being there and applying it for weight and pressures. But there are a few people where rumble passing is the answer. And that's because they have that instant win capability. I was confident that Joseph is good enough to beat everyone in the 77 division. But I also knew we need to beat the mental barrier. So that's why we trained of not getting entangled. But we wanted actually to get entangled with most people. I think the only two people we didn't want to get entangled was Tommy and Mateo. If I remember correctly, in the Tommy match, you did quite a lot of loose passing, even though you were worried about getting entangled. And it seemed like the only time he really entangled you was when you had like a near side underhook and he had a scoop grip and you like really had to work to get you entangled. And then you were out of there like relatively quickly. Is there maybe a technique specifically that you avoided? And with Tommy especially, like the game plan was no eye stepping, outside passing left to the right, or some to the right tip, go to the left, because he's really good with his matrix style type of guard, especially if you high, uh, high step pass. Like you can watch the stuff on B team, I think. It's Nicky Ryan with Tommy, and you see Nicky Ryan lost the high step, right? Nicky Ryan is one of the most gifted passers in Jiu Jitsu, but Tommy entangled every time. So every time, Nikki did a high step, Tommy entangled. So we wanted to avoid that. And I think Joel did it masterful. It's basically which leg are you leading with? Are you leading with your inside leg or your outside leg? Like high stepping, I would say it's like you're bringing your outside leg to their hip. And so that I think can leave yourself more susceptible to matrixes and stuff like this. So I was really trying to drive in with my near side leg, which from there, I really didn't think there was as much of a threat of a matrix from there and really trying to crowd his near side leg in that case, or the, the leg that's closest to me, because that's what's going to be doing a lot of the entangling and 
Like that's going to be like the first point of engagement. So if I'm able to just keep that out of the way, so like I would often play with it at my hip, especially when I was at the start, like I'd try to flank and then kind of keep that foot out of the way by crowding him. So now we have a strategy for each opponent. Joseph has trust and confidence to implement that strategy, and they've selected skills to implement in each match. So now it's time to go out there and perform. And in the corner, Dima would offer some technical advice. Yeah, like the, you... Kind of like the cross scoop stack pass thing. Yeah, if you uh, hear closely, you can uh, hear me yeah, screaming. Yeah, use your knee, use your knee. Use your knee. And then almost passes Mateos. That was, that was useful cornering. I was like, oh, <laughs> yes, I'll use my knee. But for the most part, he made sure Joseph stayed down the path of the perfect strategy and stayed persistent when he started to face adversity. Like, for example, like in the match with Taza, I wasn't necessarily confident in the wrestling. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll just pull guard. And that kind of carefreeness was something that he like just shot down. He's like, okay, no, we're not going to pull. Even if there, we encounter some degree of like, like trouble there, we're just going to like, keep going with that game plan because he was like, okay, he thinks I'll be able to out wrestle in that match. So not having that back door of, okay, oh, fuck it. I'll just pull guard again. Or if I feel like there's a little bit of an obstacle, just like kind of being persistent to some degree. So to summarize, step one is to design the perfect strategy to beat a given opponent. Step two is to determine how confident the athlete is in implementing that perfect strategy. Step three is to design a training program to bridge the gap between confidence and the perfect strategy. Step four is to select specific skills to implement or avoid in each match. And step five is to trust and be persistent in the plan when you're competing. It was a real honor to meet Joseph and Dima. And I'm very grateful that they've allowed and encouraged me to share their athlete-coach relationship. And just as Danaher gives all the credit to his athletes, Dima does the same. At the Premier League, talent work ethic. That job of talent to lead all three to make a champion. Chinese sweatshop work ethic. <laughs> if you haven't already, check out Dima and Joseph's Instagram in the description below, as well as the Outlier database. Hope you all enjoyed the video and I'll talk to you in the Discord. And if we've hit that 3000 like mark, you can find the full conversation here.